Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1981 adventure classic Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, Raiders of the Lost Ark is actually one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, this is one of those reviews that's been a long time coming, as well as the other films in the Indiana Jones franchise. For whatever reason, I just haven't cracked this particular whip yet, so... Uh, I'm going to take my time and just really, uh, break, uh, down these films, uh, and, uh, just, just really share my enthusiasm and genuine love for, uh, uh a lot of these movies. Um, not all of them because there's one in particular that I did not like at all, but I will save my thoughts for that for another time. Now, Raiders of the Lost Ark, though, is the first installment in the Indiana Jones franchise, and it's widely considered by many to not only be the best film in the series, which I personally agree with, but also the pinnacle and the peak of the adventure genre. Uh, and I agree with that, too. I think this is the best adventure film. This is one of those rare films that, to me personally, is honestly mostly perfect. I really don't have any significant issues with this film. So a lot of this video is just going to be me praising one thing after another, but that's just how it is with Raiders of the Lost Ark. The film is directed by uh, Steven Spielberg, who to me personally is without a doubt, one of the finest and one of the best filmmakers of any generation. But here you have prime Spielberg and Prime Spielberg is definitely a different animal. And his direction in this is so daring. It's so thrilling. It's so much fun to watch. You can really sense and feel the passion that he has for this film in every frame. The action sequences, uh, the way that they're set up, and the trifecta that, that has uh, uh, the uh, sequence with the truck chase and um the well of souls and everything that comes after that that is such an amazing trifecta of action and very few films have even come close to equaling it and he directed each of those set pieces with just the same amount of energy and uh dynamic uh, camera work and feel for the flow of the scene. It's, it's really some tremendous, terrific stuff. Also, it's a film that really could have collapsed with a different director or the wrong person behind the camera, because it's a movie where you really need to have a particular tone visually as well as with the writing and with, with the performances of the cast and, and so on. And it's a tone that's kind of difficult to pull off because it's a combination of earnest, serious thrills mixed with over-the-top camp that was an element that was very prevalent in the films uh, that this movie is inspired by which is the over-the-top serials from the 30s and 40s that involve these adventurers who get in, get uh stuck in these precarious positions and they have to somehow some way beat the odds and escape these uh booby traps or uh all these elaborate uh deftifying scenarios and a lot of that was done very tongue-in-cheek and so you have you have to kind of copy the same sort of vibe and i feel spielberg really nailed it and it's something that i i definitely don't feel is as simple or as easy to do as spielberg makes it appear to be and you also have to look at the uh, factor of the, the conditions of the shoot. The conditions uh, were 
honestly pretty horrific. The uh, the, the uh, location that they were shooting at had just insanely high temperatures. A lot of the, the cast and crew actually wound up getting very sick uh, with, uh, with uh, some kind of uh, bug that was going around. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. I don't think it was dysentery, but it was something along those lines. And it was bad enough that there were some sequences that had to be adjusted uh, by Spielberg and by other people involved kind of last minute because so many people were just sick. And with the wrong guy behind the camera, that could have caused everything to collapse too. Uh, when you have uh, issues with people being sick and and uh, all this other stuff going on. And you also have to think about it from the perspective of this was at the time kind of not really a popular genre like how many adventure films really were there before raiders of the lost ark that did well in the box office not that many uh but because of spielberg's involvement and lucas's involvement he was very vital to this film's success as well you have a very special film that really does feel like a lightning in a, in a bottle kind of situation and scenario in film history. And uh, yeah, I can't, I can't sing enough praises for Spielberg when it comes to his direction in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It just had the perfect balance of uh, just technique and skill mixed with uh, tone and, and overall vibe and mood and atmosphere and, and feel for for each scene and for each performer uh just definitely in my opinion easily in in the top five of his uh, best directorial work now the script by lawrence Kasdan uh or, or cast in based on the story by george lucas and philip kaufman this script is also spectacular as great as spielberg's direction is with this film I definitely don't feel that the film would really be as well-renowned or work as well as it does without such a sterling script. This is a screenplay that should be studied when it comes to how to write the perfect adventure movie or a great action film because of just the way that everything is structured. First off, you have a, a really just fun and, and, and great introduction to uh, the, the film's uh, iconic hero. Uh, it, it, the way that it opens up with the mountain and when Indiana Jones is a first showcase to the audience is the epitome of cool. Like immediately you're drawn to this character of Indiana Jones because of how the screenplay writes him as this genuinely larger than life hero. And as it goes along, you have the sequence at, at the uh, temple where Indiana Jones makes the, sw the, the swap uh, and gets the idol, but then he's got to face all these booby traps. And one of them is this giant rolling boulder, and he just barely escapes it, only for the prize to be stolen at the end by this uh, just total jerk in Belloc. And so immediately, as an audience member, you get your thrills, you get your excitement, uh, you get some intrigue because of what's going on with the with the temple and the ruins and 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 all the booby traps and everything, uh, and then you get some a even uh, extra intrigue uh, added on top of things with with Belloc and also with Sapito and what's going on with him. You know, you give me, you throw me the idol, I give you the whip. You know that whole sort of stuff. And it just creates a very compelling dynamic from the very start of the story. 
And then it even carries over when he's running away from Belloc and the natives and goes into the plane with Jock and there's a snake in, 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 in the plane. Uh, just, just a, just a rousing, just fantastic opening. And then things settle down a little bit. Uh, the film establishes, uh, Indiana Jones as more than just an adventurer establishes Indiana Jones as a genuinely intelligent professor of archeology span who really knows his stuff. And then it gives you the, the, the seeds of what's to come when it comes to the plot with the, the government guys from uh, the U S coming to uh, the college and speaking to uh, Dr. Jones and, and telling him about the Nazis and their plan to obtain the Ark. And that leads to uh, Indiana Jones uh, going on another adventure, uh, being funded by the government to try to, you know, get this arc before the Nazis do. And then just when you think, okay, things can't get any more interesting, the screenplay throws in the character of Marion Ravenwood and, uh, builds her up and shows her off to uh, the audience and does a lot of uh, um, good writing in terms of establishing her character and making her character gruff, but still likable and, and full of charisma and able to hold her own against such a larger than life character in Indiana Jones. And, you still have Belloc who's still there and still a thorn in Indiana Jones side, but this time he's got the help of the Nazis and who doesn't hate Nazis. At, at least most people do. I know, I know I'm one of them. So, I mean, that that's just a great villain to begin with is just the Nazis. And then you throw in Belloc, who's this guy with the way that he's written, he's just constantly, foiling indiana jones and stealing his thunder so you definitely want to punch the guy in the face and see him lose or see his head explode at the end of the movie and you have other little supporting characters who are on the side of evil like tote who has his own memorable uh, snide just says slimy nature to him and then you have the action which the action in the script is just amazing. There's just w one set piece after another that is just incredibly exciting uh, and just has a lot of room for stunts and uh, gunplay and, and, and punches and explosions and, and everything that you want out of an action film. And then it still has the adventure because you have the well of souls with all the snakes and uh, all of the stuff that goes on with that. And, and then you also have even more characters that are instantly endearing like Sala. And even prior to that Brody, where there's even like lines of dialogue that suggest that he was an adventurer in the vein of Indiana Jones at one point in his life. Cause he talks about how he would have lo loved to have gone on the adventure uh, to try to find the Ark, but now he's too old and he can't, he can't really uh, do it. So, but he, he wishes he was there with Indy and it just really just gels together into something that's just so unique and special and it also throws in a nice amount of grit to it that's something that i really love about this script and about this film is that it's got a grit to it it's gritty it's not only just dark and violent at times but it's got a genuine amount of grit to it you have the whole sequence where indiana jones thinks that marion is dead and he's drinking himself into a stupor and he's suicidal He's willing to to take a gun and shoot Belloc and deal with the consequences. That's something that you don't see a lot of nowadays in these kind of popcorn adventure movies. And there are some elements of the script that are a little campy that 
are kind of similar to some of the things that people would criticize for some of the lesser films in the series or the knockoffs of Indiana Jones, like the stuff with the monkey. But I felt that the way that that was written was still decent enough and still had some memorable stuff like the bad dates moment. And they didn't really overdo it when it comes to like the monkey and make it an integral or, or a big part of the film and, and and just uh really go overboard with the cuteness and whatever. They didn't do that. And I know that a lot of people have started to criticize the climax nowadays saying that, oh, well, Indiana Jones is useless. He doesn't even need to be there. The arc uh, would have destroyed the Nazis without his help. And in a different kind of film that might bother me, but the fact that this is a movie that already had like multiple, just exciting, thrilling action sequences, like the stuff in the bar in, uh, I believe, I think it's Nepal. I believe, I believe. Yeah. The bar in Nepal that Marion owns and that whole sequence, the bars on fire. And there's a really fun bar fight and then the stuff in Cairo and then even like the sequences with the staff of raw where Indiana Jones is going into the, the, the room that has the map, the map room and just the way that that scene is shot and that the way that that scene is structured from a writing perspective is really great stuff and there's no action in it. I love that scene. I love the way that scene is written. I love the way that it's built I love what happens afterwards where it leads to Indiana Jones and his own crew digging for the Ark and then the stuff with the Well of Souls and then how that transitions into the sequence with the plane and the fight with the, the German mechanic and the truck chase and all of this just great stuff. And that alone more than makes up for the fact that the climax features Indiana Jones and Marion just tied up. That's fine with me because you had so much action and intrigue and thrills leading up to that point that you can, you can, it can get away with having an ending like that. And it's not like it's not satisfying that the Nazis still get their comeuppance. I mean, Tote's face melts off his body and, uh, uh, Belloc's head explodes. And, so it still works then. And I love the ending too with the warehouse. I think that is just a, such a great, uh, just clever uh, way to just end things and, and just leave the audience wondering how many more of these artifacts are there and what are the stories behind them? And was Indiana Jones involved in, in, in obtaining them as well? And it just leaves you with all these possibilities of, of potential future adventures with these characters. And yeah, I just, I love this script. It's a big example as to why this film is just so good to me. Such a great, just iconic, incredible film, just because of the way this script is just so well written by Kasten and everybody else involved. Uh, with this story in terms of building not just Indiana Jones, but every other character in the film, whether it's companions and friends of Indy or the bad guys or the villains. Uh, and just the way that the action set pieces and the action sequences are put into the film and the way that they're, they're set up and the way that they string together, the way that the other archeological aspects are also tied together into the film in terms of finding the arc. It's just all very satisfying, just special stuff. So yeah, I can't get enough uh, of the, of this script and it's not just all this other structural stuff. Like you got great lines of dialogue too, very memorable lines from a multitude of different characters. Uh, so yeah, just, without a doubt, one of the finest screenplays uh, out there. And then you have the cast, which, you know, as good as the direction is, as great as the, as, as the, the writing is, every 
great classic film needs a cast that is on the same level as everything else. And Raiders definitely has that. You get Harrison Ford as the man with the hat, Indiana Jones. In what, to me personally, is his quintessential film role. And Harrison would probably even say that himself. Like, this is his favorite role that he's ever done in anything is playing Indiana Jones. And what's crazy is he was very close to not even doing it because even though he was Spielberg and I think, yeah, he was Spielberg's first choice to play Indiana Jones. Lucas was reluctant because he already worked with Harrison and star Wars and because, you know, Harrison is Han Solo, but he didn't want Indiana Jones, who is this other franchise that he's really uh, passionate about and and really wanted to, to get off the ground, he didn't necessarily want to have uh, a, a Star Wars guy tied to it. So he was willing or he wanted to uh, go in a different direction. And that's why you have screen tests that exist with different actors, including uh, Tom Selleck. And Tom Selleck almost got the role. If it wasn't for Madden P.I. and the fact that there was some kind of scheduling conflict with that show, he would have been Indiana Jones. And he would have been uh, in Madden P.I. in the same year. But it wasn't meant to be. And what's also crazy, uh, an, an, an extra added layer of craziness, is that the scheduling conflicts were actually resolved and after Harrison was ultimately placed in the role, Selleck could have done the movie. And so Selleck could have been in one of the biggest hits of the summer and also in one of the biggest shows on television. And his, his star would have just rocketed to the stratosphere as a result. But as it is, you know, it wasn't meant to be. So he was relegated more to being a TV star, which still led him to having a lot of success. And in fact, there was even an episode of Magnum P.I. that even was like a parody of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark or Indiana Jones. It was called Raiders. I think it was like Raiders of the Lost Arts or something like it was. It was one of those things where it was like a, a little little parody of uh, Indiana Jones because you could tell that 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 Selleck probably he probably uh uh he had a, a little bit of uh I I'm probably not gonna say like misgivings or whatever when it comes to not getting the role, but it's definitely something that kind of stuck with him a little bit. But he was willing to have some fun with it, which which means that it ultimately probably didn't bother him a ton. But uh I can't imagine anyone else in the role though than Harrison Ford. Selleck probably would have done a good job, but I can't. I, the Harrison is just an actor, at least in his prime, who had the charisma to pull off a role like this, but also the acting chops to really handle a lot of the, let's just say, a little more subtle nuances of this character. The little uh, uh, bits, facial expressions, the little smirks, the little changes and in the inflection and the tone of his voice, uh, like the whole sequence with Marion where he's asking, you know, does it hurt? Or some of the other moments that he actually improvised. You know that iconic sequence with the guy in the market in the square with the sword, the swordsman doing all the sword flips and all of that nonsense. And then Indy just pulls out the gun and shoots him. That was improvised by Harrison Ford. We wouldn't have that moment without Harrison because Harrison was feeling under the weather because he was dealing with the same sickness as a lot of other people were. And he was like, I don't want to keep doing this whip uh, uh, stuff. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I am sick. Uh, can I just shoot the guy <laughs> and the rest is history. Um, and Harrison was such a trooper. Like he not only did a good chunk of his own stunts so much to the point where he actually tore a ligament in his knee shooting this film. Yeah. Yeah. He, he put himself out there that much 
tore a ligament in his knee and he's he toughed it out. He didn't even go and get surgery. He didn't even go to the hospital. He just put some ice on it and went back to, to uh, shooting the rest of the film. So Harrison Ford, in a lot of ways, he is Indiana Jones. He's that tough. And he just was the perfect guy to play this mix of dashing adventurer and James Bond because of the, the character was very heavily influenced by James Bond, but with a twist, you know, he's the action guy. He's good with a gun. He's good with his fists. He's got some wit to him and charm and he's, he's, he's very uh, charismatic and he can definitely be suave when he needs to be. Uh, but he's very intelligent. He's very well-spoken. And I feel that Harrison just nailed every aspect of that character and just, just, just easily one of his best performances. Um, Karen Allen was also amazing as Marion. I can't think of anyone else playing that role other than Karen Allen. I know that there were other actresses who were, who were auditioning for this role and were potentially, uh, considered for it, but Karen was the one that that really won everybody over, and you could definitely see it. I mean, she's got her own magnetic personality and charisma and charm to her. She's never upstaged in any scene with with uh, with uh, Harrison or or even Paul Freeman. She holds her own in 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 every scene that she's in, and there are some scenes where she almost steals the scene away from. Everyone else in the sequence, uh, just a great uh, performance, just a great example of a female performer who's playing a character who's tough, who does it in a believable way. You, you really do buy that she can drink some guy under the table or she can hold her own in a fight or she's smart enough to try to find a way to escape from uh, her captors. And at the same time, you get why she falls for Indiana Jones and why she loves him and cares about him and wants to be with him. And the chemistry between her and Harrison is just off the charts. So, yeah, really a great performance by Karen. And Paul Freeman was also fantastic as, as, as Belloc, the rival archaeologist who in a lot of ways is a mirror to Indiana Jones. And he even references it, references this. He's like, you know, you and I are, are very similar. We could be the same. And the differences are not really as vast as you might think. They both have a love for archaeology and antiquities. They both are willing to go and do whatever it takes and go to extreme lengths to obtain these artifacts. But, you know, Belloc is more into it for the money and for the power, and Indiana Jones is more into it for preserving history. And they just make a good uh, uh, dynamic in the film, really, because it's this light versus dark thing going on. And speaking of dark, Ronald Lacey, who plays Tote, Who's just this completely sadistic character? Uh, he used to give me nightmares as a kid, He's, and that that shows you that you've got a character who really works, and you got a performer who is really giving the the performance their all. If you really think about it, like this is not a character that is really that integral to necessarily a lot of the film. Doesn't have a ton of screen time. But he really does leave an impact. In a lot of ways, it's due to what Ronald brings to that role. And then you have John Reese davies who plays Sala, who's just this just ball of energy and fun. And he's just, just a really just jovial type of uh, character who provides a nice contrast to Harrison and his deadpan and, and other characters in the film. And then you have Denholm Elliott, who plays Marcus Brody, who's Indiana Jones's friend. And the two also have some good chemistry in the scenes featuring the two. 
there are some moments where you know he's, you could kind of tell that he's a little aloof, but not necessarily a guy who's a complete total dunce either. There's also a certain understanding and a certain bit of intelligence that that Brody has that that Elliot convincingly brings to the screen. And you have other actors and actresses who were in it as well, like Wolf Collar, who plays Colonel Dietrich, Anthony Higgins, who plays uh, Gobler, uh, Don Fellows and William Hookins. They appear as the Army intelligence agents. You know, and they're the ones that, you know, say top men. Uh, and you have George Harris, who plays Katanga, the captain of the steamer. Uh, you have Fred Sorensen, who plays the pilot jock. You got... Pat Roach, who plays uh, the the uh, the Nazi mechanic who gets in the memorable fist fight with Indiana Jones near the plane. You've got um, a bunch of other people, uh, including Frank Marshall, who's the producer. He was in it as, as the pilot of the flying wing. And Alfred Molina has his first theatrical appearance in this as uh, uh, Sapito. In the opening uh, sequence uh, that that takes place in uh, Peru, so yeah, just just a, a an absolutely uh, uh, amazing, just astonishing cast, and it doesn't stop there. I mean, you got the cinematography by Douglas Slocum, which is also stellar in its own right. There's just some really just gorgeous looking shots like the shot of the mountain in Peru, the start of the film and just the way that he just showcases the, the temple in Peru with the idol and everything uh, and the, and the well of souls and the whole sequence on the Island with the Ark of the covenant and just, just a great use of lighting like the Nepal scene and in the, in the, at the bar and just just a really great looking movie like the, there are a lot of shots in this that honestly you could take a photo of put in, put a, and put it up in an art gallery like really um and i was kind of fumbling my words there because some of the shots leave you speechless like the whole shot uh that takes place uh as during uh, sunset where Indiana Jones is in shadow and silhouette with all these other workers while they're working on digging for the Ark. Uh, that shot is absolutely breathtaking. And there's a lot of other shots like that throughout the film. And then you have the editing by Michael Kahn, which is magnificent. Just some really just fine-tuned, finely crafted edits that just really elevate the action set pieces, the the uh, sequences that involve Indiana Jones using a gun, using a whip, using his fists, or using, or using a truck, um, as well as the more supernatural, mysterious stuff, like when the arc is open, or even the stuff that doesn't have to do with the supernatural, but just has to do with stuff that definitely would make your skin crawl in a different way, like the sequences with the snakes and the Well of Souls, it's just a film that has a very consistent beat and pulse of energy to it. And Khan's editing is a big example and a big reason why it's able to do that. And then you got John Williams's score, which is iconic in its own right. His music for this film is honestly some of my favorite work of his. It's, a lot of uh, tunes and a lot of um, notes that come together in just such a wonderful way that just evoke the spirit of adventure, unlike anything that I can think of, from the main theme uh, to even the, the, the theme for the arc. Just absolutely stunning, spectacular, just one of a kind stuff when it comes to uh, the compositions here by John Williams. And then I got to give props to ILM and the stunt guys and a lot of the other people who were involved with the film when it comes to the visual effects or uh, other parts of the film that dealt with um, action sequences. 
because they also delivered on a incredible front too. The ILM with the stuff with uh, uh, the ghosts and the visual effects of the Ark being opened up and the, and the power of God uh, and like the lights, the light coming out of the Ark and just hitting people in the chest and their chests all glowing. And of course, the melting head stuff, which was actually Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace, who would go on to uh, win an Oscar for the Fly remake with with uh, uh, Jeff Goldblum, directed by David Cronenberg. The melting heads, that was Chris Wallace. So you had Industrial Light Magic, who were working on a lot of the effects, but he also had makeup stuff that was done by Chris Wallace, doing some of his earliest work. And it, you, you could just tell that from those those scenes that he was definitely an up and coming talent. And in fact, after he did this film, there were so many people that were like, Hey, how did you do this? We, we, we want to do this kind of thing for our movie. And that's a, that's a sign of a great film is that it's already leaving that kind of industry wide impact right after its release. So yeah, the makeup effects by Chris Wallace the uh, visual effects by Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, I think, I don't know if Dennis Mirren, I, mean, I think he might have been involved. Uh, or Richard Edlund, I think some of the, I think either one, I think one of them was definitely involved with this one. And then, of course, the stunt work. There's some great stunt work. I think Terry Leonard might have been involved with it. Like the whole stunt with the truck going underneath the truck, it was all done for real. No CGI. No green screen, because that wasn't a thing back then. If you were going to do this kind of stuff, you were going to do it for real. And that just added to the quality of the film, because there weren't a lot of distractions. There weren't a lot of moments where you're like, oh, well, that's clearly fake. No, there's a lot of stuff where you're like, wow, they did that shit for real. And even the visual effects and even the other sort of stuff that's a little bit more out there, even that was done in a way that still looked very real because of the tangible stuff that they were doing with the effects and like the pacing of the movie is just as fast as the crack of a whip, just whip like pacing that just goes by like a lightning strike or a, a beam of light from the Ark of the covenant. It's a, it's, it's a film that just, maintains and keeps just a breakneck pace but still manages to have some moments where it slows down enough to catch your breath but then picks up again and it's a it's just one of the most relentlessly paced films that i've seen but also one of the most well paced films it's not just fast for the sake of, of being fast it still maintains your interest throughout and still is Every bit is compelling, uh, even in the scenes where things slow down. And you have these character moments between characters, like uh, the scene with Marion and Indiana Jones on the boat, and, and so on. But yeah, I really don't have m much else to say about Raiders, except it's a film that I will easily look at again and again and again and just never cease to find the same amount of enjoyment, adventure, or thrills. Uh, if you haven't seen this film, for whatever reason, I cannot recommend it enough. Anyway, thank you for watching my long, in-depth uh, review of Indiana Jones uh, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, and until next time, I'll see you later. See ya.